Thank you everyone for coming tonight. This is the Municipal Vulnerability um, Preparedness Program uh, that we are participating in. We're hoping uh, to receive more grants uh, under this program. We have already received uh, $47,325 for design work on the Mill Village um, culvert just below Old Deerfield. Uh, we received a small grant to get certified last year and the idea of this program is to um, be proactive. In other words, not actually wait until the culvert is washed out, but upgrade our culverts as we identify them as being um, problematic from past events. I just want to back up and give you a little summary of why we're, we're participating in the MVP program. It's brand new, number one. Um, but it's the governor's program uh, to acknowledge the fact that there just is not the federal dollars available anymore uh, for the climate change impact. What we've done in the past is participate through Natural Resource and Conservation Services um, Emergency Watershed Protection Program. Uh, we were able to get several, um, and uh, maybe you can just go ahead to the slide um, on what projects we have done in the past through the EWP program. I think it's the third slide, maybe. Um, That's later, much later. On. Oh, okay. Well, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we, this is transitioning to a new program. And it's very important, part of the program is to have a listening session in the community to identify areas of concern. We have um, obviously have problems around Long 5 and 10 uh, and Wapping Road since we had a landslide in 2011 that brought silt down from Steam Mill River Road and it silted up between 5 and 10 in Mill Village and that has now been a perennial problem there. We also have had over the years since the late 90s actually problems with Bloody Brook. Um, it just has not been able to um, flow to handle these uh, the frequent uh, storms that we've been receiving. So what we've done is started to participate in um, this program. Uh, we were one of the first communities in the state certified because of our work that we've done in the past. And um, I'll turn this over now to Chris that he can talk about the process we went to get certified. Great, thanks, Carolyn. I'm, I'm Chris Curtis. I'm working as a consultant for um, the select board, and I'm also a town resident. Um, just want to tell you what the agenda is for tonight. Basically, we're going to quickly go through and summarize the uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness plan that we have completed for the town. Um, we're going to talk about um, projects that might come out of that plan that are implementation that would actually take some of the recommendations and put them into action. Um, and then we want to set aside at least half of the meeting um, for your questions, your comments, your suggestions, things that you feel are important for us to address, things perhaps that we might have missed in the first um, go round with this because we are in the process of updating the plan already and we're going to add um, some additional um, culvert repair work to it that has um, become a priority for the town. So we want to um, get your thoughts on, on those issues. So um, Carolyn kind of summarized this, but we got our original um, grant from the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs um, last year. We went through a process of collecting data about all the different kinds of hazards that the town is dealing with and facing. We had a uh, large public workshop here in January of last year, um, which was um, intended to, you know, inform the, the planning process and, and to get much, as much engagement from the community as we possibly could. Uh, and that resulted in a, a, a matrix being put together, which was a matrix of suggested actions to address the, the biggest problems that the town was facing. And all of that went into a, a municipal vulner, vulnerability preparedness plan that was submitted to the state and um, as Carolyn mentioned, we did receive the um, certification that the plan was accepted and the town is now a certified MVP community, which means that you can get more grant money um, to do projects. Um, and it's a great program because it actually has money for implementation projects, which oftentimes you get planning grants and then there's no implementation money and, 
and it's just a plan that sits on a shelf. In this case, they've, they've backed up their, their planning money with, with real um, project money, which is, which is pretty exciting. So um, as Carolyn mentioned, there's um, been this plan submitted um, in March, got certified, um, we're now eligible for, for grants. The plan, um, just to kind of quickly summarize some of the most important points about it, um, we went through this process in the workshop of prioritizing what are the most important hazards that the town has um, faced or, or is fa going to face in the future. And those uh, top four hazards became the focus of what the plan uh, was intended to address. So what the, the general public that attended the meeting prioritized these, what they decided was that uh, the top four hazards were tornadoes and windstorms, hurricanes and tropical storms, floods and dam failures, and severe winter storm and ice storms. Um, and then we went through a process where we broke up into smaller groups. Um, some of you might have been here for this workshop. And we, we talked about what were the key sort of strengths and vulnerabilities in town um, in addressing these kinds of uh, storm events and, and impacts. And again, just to kind of make this as brief as possible, we, we really focused on, on vulnerabilities. And the, and the ones that came up over and over again are listed here. The, uh, the water and the wastewater treatment plants, um, the great hydro dams upstream, the variety of culverts throughout town, specific flood prone neighborhoods, um, particularly Old Deerfield and the Bloody Brook area, businesses with hazardous chemicals, the schools, um, including um, the private and the public schools, gas stations, um, the water supply wells, the Stillwater Bridge, failing septic systems in homes near Old Deerfield, an emergency um, evacuation plan for um, some of the, the areas that are most flood prone, um, riverbank erosion, um, impacts on farming, uh, down power lines, roads in the floodplain, and the update of the floodplain maps and bylaw in the town. So this slide talks about um, some of the mitigation work that the town has already completed. And I'm gonna just ask either Carolyn or Kevin to talk about what, what you've done to this point. This is, um, these are things that happened to us as a town over the course of the last few years um, that we had worked through the Emergency Watershed Protection Program and, and RCS. And as you can see, there's quite big dollars involved in just a few of these bigger projects. Um, but Kevin um, is going to talk about some of the things that he handles um, on a regular basis every storm. We check all our culverts and make sure they're cleaned out um, before every big storm. I mean, it's a real, it's labor intensive. But um, one of the problems with Upper Road was that we did not have proof that we were maintaining our culverts. So um, our crews are drive around and they take a picture of the culvert um, with our GPS unit, it gives the um, locations and the, and the date and the time and the picture of the condition of the culvert so that should that culvert wash out, we are able to replace it in a relatively um, efficient manner. Under the Emergency Watershed Protection Program, you did not need a declared event, you just needed an event. And we have um, the apps on our phones to show how the river is reacting and how much flow is in the river, and that's good enough. And so um, it, it, the match money, we haven't had to come to the town for a lot of this match money because we've been able to do it in kind through our highway department or my time. And this is why this program is so important to us because this is, this is a, um, money for design work. It's, it's for the permitting part as well as the implementation money. And this is a good replacement for the federal program. Um, it gives us, and it gives us the ability to um, predict where, the, where we want to um, replace, identify areas where we want to replace, and then up, upgrade them before an event happens so it's least disruptive, least costly, and it's not an emergency situation. So this is, this is a very important thing. As you can see, the, there's several million dollars involved that um, came to the town, 
And this, we're hoping to do this t again through this meeting tonight. Okay. So um, the plan ended up uh, coming up with a series of prioritized recommendations, again, um, based on the public input that we got from, from that meeting in January. Uh, and these are the, the most important things that people felt needed to be addressed right away in, in the community. So it was to replace the problem culverts, um, develop an emergency action plan with Great River Hydro, work on protecting the flood storage areas um, in town, um, particularly through the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. It's also um, possible to use floodplain zoning to help with that. To establish and implement a mosquito control district, um, improving the reverse 911 warning system, uh, advancing and coordinating emergency and, and evacuation plans between the town and the private schools, implementing no-till farming in the agricultural areas, carrying out a utility undergrounding and tree management program to bury power lines, petitioning the Federal Emergency Management Agency to update the town's floodplain maps and also update the flood zoning, and floodproof the town's wastewater and water treatment plants. So those are some of the things that um, we are going to be working on. And um, there are, again, there is potential to do funded projects um, for many of these things through the MVP program. So um, next steps. We want to try to update our MVP plan because there are some problem culverts that have um, come up as issues even since the time that we submitted our plan in March. Um, so we know that there are certain projects that we want to add to it. But with this meeting tonight, we're looking for your input and your thoughts on any additional projects or um, recommendations that we might have missed or might want to consider for this updated plan. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, we did get a, a grant, um, a second round grant already under the MVP program to hire an engineering firm to do plans for the Mill Village Road culvert. That work is starting now, so um, we hope to have that ready so that the next round that comes up, which should be coming fairly soon, will apply for construction money for that Mill Village Road culvert. Um, but we also want to um, be ready with other projects that we might apply for design money for at the same time. So there's a, a number of potential additional funding opportunities that we want to look at and pursue. One is, is the MVP round three that I was just mentioning. In addition to that, there's a state um, division of Ecolo ecological resources program for culvert replacement that we might be able to pursue. And then um, federal um, and state grants for hazard mitigation and pre-disaster mitigation also provide some money that could be useful. Um, and then with the current grant, the one that we have right now, we're also going to be working on updating the town's floodplain zoning and uh, working with FEMA to try to get the maps um, updated because they're very outdated and, and things have changed quite a bit. So these are some of the problem areas that we've identified for flooding um, that we want to try to address. And, and Kevin, maybe... Um, since these are your photos, you could speak to, you know, what these are and, and where we're focusing. All right. So the top left-hand one right now, that is uh, Kelleher Drive. Um, it is a steel culvert. It is not able to handle the amount of water that is flowing through there. Obviously, that backs up, which inadvertently drops down to the bottom right hand, uh, which is one of our residents. And every time that backs up, this person basically loses his backyard. Um, the last storm that we just had that came through pretty hard, the water was in, within inches of his back door flooding his entire house. So these is, those are the two areas there. The top right hand side is uh, Wapping Road right behind, or actually it's close to the candy kitchen. Um, I'd like to just make a, a public announcement as part of this. When we have a problem here, it's not because the culvert is, or because the drains are blocked. It's because the culvert is handling more water than it, can, than it can take, or taking more water than it can handle, and it is backing up onto Wapping Road. So if we're able to relieve the pressure there, and the water from Wapping Road has some place to go to, 
you won't have backup like that. Majority of the time we have problems here, again, it's not because water is coming from somewhere else, it's actually backing up from those two drains, which is flooding that area. Uh, bottom left hand is on the back side of Wapping Road behind Old Savage's Market. Um, again, this is an area where we had the problem with the mudslide that came down many years ago. And honestly, every time we get a heavy rain, I am continually dealing with the silt that is coming down through there. Um, it's a major issue for us. Just this side of it where you can see a little bit of the water, that is the roadway. Um, and basically what happens is uh, this water comes rushing down, takes all of the silt along with it, blows out in the corner because the corner can't handle it, um, and then just goes across the road, and then it starts flooding out the other people's uh, septic systems you know, on 5 and 10 Wapping Road area. Um, the, and then when we do actually get this to stay where it's supposed to go, now I have a huge issue with uh, silt that continues down. That will eventually continue down, go down further, get over to Wapping Road area, inadvertently gets to the other side of the road from 5 and 10 to Mill Village Road. That area gets flooded in, um, that area gets silted in, and that inadvertently all kind of goes back to if we can start at the river and start cleaning our way back through, there's a pretty good opportunity we can reduce a lot of these problems. Again, the big problem that, that I look at is not only do I have to worry about our residents, but um, legality-wise and, and liability, I just can't have this thing flush wide open because if I do that, no, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ruin Waitley. So now we would be responsible for Waitley. And then if Waitley did the same thing, then they would be responsible to Hatfield. And then from Hatfield, then it goes into the river. So realistically, if, if, if the world worked in the perfect form, which I have doubts about, would be starting at the Deerfield or the Connecticut River in Hatfield, having them start there and working their way back towards us. And then we can continue moving back forward upstream. Because if I take care of something, all I'm going to do is I'm going to ruin somebody else's life below me. Um, and again, we have to be careful of that because of liabilities. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll take the next one, Kevin. Uh, so we have a number of suggestions for um, amendments or additional projects that we want to include in the updated version of our um, municipal vulnerability plan. And they include some, of the, some projects that Kevin was making reference to um, just a minute ago, looking at finding design money for culvert replacements at Kelleher Drive at North Main Street, Routes 5 and 10 at Richardson's Candy Kitchen, that, that would be a mass dot project, Brome's Pond Road, uh, Wapping Road, and then there are, are several culverts that are private culverts off of North, Ma North Main Street, which are also uh, um, problematic. We're not sure um, at this point whether state funding can be used to address those because they're on private property, um, but we're investigating that. And then in addition to the culvert replacements, there are a few other projects. Um, one is taking a look at that um, wetland and stream complex that runs from Route 5 and 10 over to Mill Village Road and doing a detailed analysis of that to see whether or not it can be cleaned up and the flow improved in that area. Um, we also want to look at flood proofing the wastewater treatment plant at Old um, Deerfield, which, uh, which did get flooded during Hurricane Irene and flood proofing the Stillwater Road uh, water department facilities, which are wells and pumping station that also got flooded during Hurricane Irene. So those are the ones that we know about. Again, what we're here tonight to hear is whether there are things in addition to those that um, you might have um, for suggestions. So um, at this point, we wanted to make sure that we left enough time, and I think we have, um, to have a, a good discussion um, so we would be happy to take your questions um, and, and your suggestions for, for projects or improvements or changes to the plan. Should you come up? Or? Yeah, if, oh. if anybody wants to speak, if you can come up, that'd be fantastic. Because there's people out in TV land that when we can hear you speaking, but they cannot. Okay. So if you'd like to speak, please come up. That would be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, so uh, Bill Mayer, PC uh, 16, Captain Lathrop Drive. Um, and so I actually thought that one of the photos, uh, that bottom left, I thought that was Captain Lathrop looking over toward Hillside. Um, 
So we have a, uh, a culvert uh, mid Captain Lathrop just, uh, just west of my home um, that um, is close to becoming a sinkhole um, on our road. Um, and um, I, can, I can see, I can hear the water flying on through uh, to the point that the last storm we had, the water was coming up through the grate. Um, uh, just as you're talking about, um, across the street, my neighbor's yard is, is flooding. Um, and um, then I know that as the water leaves my property, goes around and heads towards uh, Body Brook Farm. Um, and then I recognize some of my neighbors um, on North Main that I can, I know that they're here because I see their backyards from there. I agree. Um, so uh, I am requesting uh, that some work be done mid-Captain Lathrop, um, especially because I'm concerned that with a sinkhole that I've only been there for six years and the road didn't used to have a dip. It's a little dip, correct. Like it has now. Yep. Um, one of the problems that, that I see is the water's got no place to go and the water's being backed up. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is the majority of the reason why we're having such backups there. If the water had a free flow place to go, it wouldn't back up, it wouldn't flood, it would stay within its, within its banks and, and life would be grand. But unfortunately, that's not where we're at right now. Um, you know, you go to house one, let's see, 130, 136, I bet, what, like 140-ish? Yeah. Mr. Martin? Oh, Mr. Martin says, I think it's 130. 136. 136. Um, that was that bottom right-hand photo. Uh, because the water is, can't go anywhere, it's being backed up by the smaller culverts. That is majority of our issues. If we can get these things opened up, then these things will move through. But again, we have to be cautious on how much we open these things up. You know, it's kind of one of those double-edged swords where, yeah, you have, you have to be... Um, paying attention to what happens with the residents, but you also have to look at the other side of it is what is gonna happen downstream. Because if we cause a problem, if we collectively as a town cause a problem downstream, now we can be liable. Now I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but there's a possibility because everybody likes to sue each other, is if we go ahead and we flood Waitley, hypothetically, arbitrarily, this isn't happening. If that does happen, Somebody could say, well, you know what? You caused my stuff to flood, so now the town of Deerfield has to pay somebody else to fix things in Waitley. So we have to be very, very mindful on what we do and how we go about it. You could say the same thing about my property. Exactly. I mean, you, uh, exactly. You know, it is. It's, so maybe I could let Mr. Martin yeah, come up. Sure. Um, and if that's what. So thank you for yeah. hearing me out. I, I feel like I'm lucky because my property is not. I, I completely understand yeah. where you are because I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, that's basically why we're here. You know, we're here to try and hear you out, which gives us more information so that way it gives us a better aspect and handle to be able to go forward to the state to be able to say these are the problems our residents are having. You know, these people are losing their property. These people have the possibility of losing their house completely flooded out because of this, these issues, and we need help. So that is why we're here, and, and again, thank you for showing. You just have to say who you are, Mr. Martin. I'm Mike Martin. I live at 136 North Main Street. And our house was a picture there on the screen there. We moved in um, the fall of 2013. Our realtor did not, or the owners of the house did not disclose that Bloody Brook was a quiet brook. But we soon discovered it was a, a really nasty brook. So the first flood we had was actually up to my, my stoop of my cellar. So I put about 10 yards of loam in to, to fill it in, to raise it up a little bit, because it had all, you know, I'm new to the area. You know, we, we love it here. Uh, about a year and a half later, after we moved in, we noticed the water coming up, and, and we took more notice of what's going on as far as the brook and we've been probably flooded out at least six or seven times. And just the amount of rain that we had last night, 
it backed up again. And I'm just wondering in my head, if we ever get a tropical storm that's really bad, uh, you know, we only can use 25 to 30 percent of our property. We can never have a garden. We actually have a picture of my family in a pool surrounded by flood water with silt. And Lord knows what's in that silt. All kinds of bacteria. I mean, there's a cause and effect. I mean, where's all this water coming from? Is it coming from the streets too? I mean, who owns all this water? It's just not uh, going from point A to point B. It's picking up water along the way. And I'm sure it's coming off the street, it's coming off of here, it's coming off of there. But, you know, cause and effect, you know, we're being, hit, we're being slammed really bad. And we actually had a realtor come over last uh, Wednesday because we're thinking about moving. And our mindset is, you know, we can't enjoy our property. We love it here. We really do. But we, we seem to be forced to move. And we don't want to move. Um, but I, it's Kevin, right? Yes, sir. He's always been, you know, right there to, to listen to me, you know, to bark and, and kind of steer me and, and, and try to calm me down because, you know, this is our property. We spent a lot of money on that house. I put a lot of sweat and tears into it. Well, actually, my wife did, but I'm disabled. And um, my kids can't go out there and enjoy the, the yard. It's, it's a swamp. You talk about water tables, you, you can't dig a hole because the water comes right up. It comes right up to our maple, uh, right on the side of the house. I, it's scary. You know, I'm constantly looking at the weather, you know. You know, what's going to happen to our family, you know? It's just, um, we're actually thinking about selling. I mean, who's going to buy our house? No one's going to buy a house in a floodplain that, that backs up because we're going to have to disclose it. I mean, we're, we're in a tight spot right now. And then we have this other little stream running through the backside of our property where the kids have their, their, uh, their play set. And that's not even out of harm's way either because the water gets so high, it goes up on towards their, their play area now. The, the one that goes across the street there, that culvert. So, you know, we got one coming this way, we got, uh, you know, one coming this way, and, and you know, we're scared. I mean, our, our property value, I wouldn't buy a house. Would you buy a house that, you know, subject, I mean, our garage, I've lost so much stuff in my garage. And slowly, the foundation of my garage, you can't use it. So, you know, I mean, how would you feel, or, you know, any resident of this, this town feel, you know, if they can't use their property or, or the kids enjoy their swing set or, you know, it's just, it's really, um, and then we have this big old tree that, dropped a big old limb and I could hear the water just rushing over it, under it, over it. I don't know, it's a, it's a big limb. No one's cleaned that up and, it, and it's at 1.30. You know, she's a nice lady, but you know, cause and effect, I mean, there's only a porthole about the size of a window pane and she looks like the way that it is, is she's got her, her little catch basin there and it catches all kinds of trash and I'm always picking up trash and boards and uh, plastic bags and um, kids' toys, balls. You know, every time we have a flood, all that washes down on, and, and collects on, on our property. But, you know, I, I can't get out there anymore and, and even pick up the trash anymore because of my disability. And um, we're thinking about moving. But then again, who's going to buy the house? I wouldn't. But, no, we're... Um, Kevin, maybe you can talk about what you were thinking of for Kelleher Drive area. Well, yeah, one of the things that um, actually Chris showed is there's a couple of private, the private ones that, that yeah, you discussed. Actually, there's two between you and Kelleher. Mm -hmm. um, we collectively as a town cannot say you have to replace a culvert. We are attempting to find out if we can utilize this grant money to work on private property. Um, the town itself will never work on private property. Um, because but if who, I do, but if, who owns the water? It's everyone's water. I mean, because well, the, wa the, water the, water, is, the water's is, is coming from the is, sky and eventually it, it collects a little bit as it continue goes along. 
you know, the further downstream, the more you're going to get. You know, the people that are closer to the beginning are just their water and what's coming out. And then as you, like, collectively go downstream, it's, it's coming from farmland, it's coming from the mountain, it's, it's coming, coming from, from the over. roads. There's some coming from the road. I mean, where's all um, that water go? I mean, it comes off the roads. I mean, it eventually goes into that stream. That stream eventually turns into the Mill River. The Mill River eventually goes through Deerfield, Waitley, and Hatfield, and then property. the Connecticut River is where it finally uh, ends up. So what I'm saying is all that water, you know, it starts off as a little brook. By the time, you know, everybody, you know, all these little things that dump into it, Correct. by the time it gets downstream, it's raging. Correct. But if, if so again, like you said, you know, who owns, you know, those surface would be, water? Those, you know? those I, I can't give you a solid answer on that. But what I can say is, well, is one of the major. hard time. You know. yeah, no, I understand. Um, and, and I understand your frustration. I'm just trying to make I a point know. that, you know, if it was just an innocent little brook, you know, you got a little water coming here, a little water there, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about water that's gaining momentum by collecting at different points. Correct. You know, sewers and, and roads and, and no, farmland. No and, sewers, just so we can be clear on that one, because the sewers are right, right. involved. Sorry. But you see what I'm saying? By the yeah. time it gets to me, sure. there, there's, there's a lot, a of, lot water. of water. It's just not just a little brook Correct. anymore. It's but if the water had some place to go, if we could open these things up and you had some relief, then you wouldn't be flooded as much. You know, is, is eventually, what we're trying to head towards, and that's pretty much, that's my understanding is pretty much what the meeting is for, is to be able to hear the pains that people like yeah. you have. And, well, and we're, yours, we're, yours are huge, and I well, understand painting, completely. No. Um, but this is what we need to be able to bring well, forward to be able things, to help us. Yeah, one of the things that um, came out of um, Tropical Storm Irene was that all the water came down from the Deerfield watershed and came down to us and washed out our riverbanks and caused flooding. Um, the riverbanks are eight to 16 feet lower along the Deerfield River now because of Irene. They just whooshed out. I can't imagine what that property looked like before. I, mean, it was, I can't it, imagine because the back yeah, of the house it, is built up with cement. Mm -hmm. There's no more stone foundation, so something happened. Well, it, there was a lot of water. So right. what we're trying to do is work with the state uh, on watershed-wide solutions. We formed a group in 2000, um, t December of 2011, and we've been meeting since um, that December because we had the landslide as well. We had Tropical Storm Irene, then we had Snowtober. I think people forgot about that, but we had that snowstorm on Halloween. Mm -hmm. Then we had the landslide in November. And so that was started the problems along Wapping Road in 5 and 10. It silted all in. So what we've been doing, uh, we, we created a group called Creating Resilient Communities. And it's the 20 communities up and down the Deerfield watershed. And we try to work together. Mm -hmm. So because you're talking about the water, I mean, they don't have control really of, of their water. And I don't know if you remember, there was a lot of... Um, you know, the town of Holly had done some repair work along the river and then they had to rip it out and do it again. And it, you know, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, and, and it wasn't done maliciously. It was just people just didn't know. And so what we were trying to do is, is get a group together that would um, help each other and leverage each other's money. And I, I think this is where we as are trying to be part of the, I mean, Bloody Brook is not a, the Deerfield River watershed. It's, it's, it's part of the Connecticut River watershed. But um, it, we, we need to trace back the water, and we need to follow the water all the way down to the Connecticut River so that um, we can come up with a solution. And this is why um, we're working through this program so that we can solve our problems here but also work collectively with our neighbors mm -hmm. so that um, we do have a solution that works long term. And it is, th these frequent intense events aren't going away. We're going to have no. more of them. And, it, and it's fiscally, um, it will bankrupt us as towns to try to address these if we don't address them as a one-time fix and upgrade like our culverts and stuff like that. And that's what we're trying to do is leverage this money to address these things proactively because we, we can't, Kevin can't afford in his budget to keep coming back and replacing these things. Just like you're uh, personally having your house be threatened, these culverts are being replaced on a regular basis, some of these 
places. And um, it costs us a lot of money. So the idea is to put open bottom culverts in so you can wish out some of the silt and, and get rid of it and move things along and, and upgrade them a little bit. And so that's why we're trying to do this. Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, <coughs> Lori Busada, 193 North Main Street. One thing I wasn't sure of that I don't remember us talking about is that I know when you straighten a river, um, it goes faster. And I also know with our little Mill Village incident that when you remove the trees, there's a whole lot more water that's not being taken up. So I, I wonder if there's places along the path of the river where we can make more storage. Um, I know Bloody Brook has grown in across the street on Jackson Road a whole lot. And I don't know if it's holding as much water as it used to because it's so filled in. So I don't know if there's any places for, I don't know if that's the place, and any places where we might um, stabilize banks with trees, that kind of thing. I don't know if that's in here. I, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, we have identified those areas as being problems. One of the major issues, one of, major, one of the major issues that I have is I can't go on a private property. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are along the brook that have used that as their personal dumping grounds for trees, brush, leaves, which inadvertently goes ahead and takes that and reduces the flow, reduces the flow, ends up backing up, backing up, include, you know, becomes, it, it just. So what you said before about a town being liable, can an individual be liable that way? That I couldn't tell you. That's not beyond me. my Because it was scope. originally a free-flowing stream, and now it's not. Well, one, one of the recommendations was to form a mosquito district. And the reason why we were interested in doing that is it seems like that's the only way that we can actually work in the Bloody Brook area in particular um, because you can go on as a mosquito district. You are exempt from most wetlands regulations, and you can go on to private property. If, if that is an area that is stagnant and potentially breeding ground for mosquitoes and, and an area of concern. So we've certainly address, been able to identify that as an area of concern. There are plenty of mosquitoes that are being bred there because of the not as free flowing as it used to be. But we have to, it's a, also part of public education. People can't, I mean, I remember we got in trouble, the select board got in trouble, this was probably back in 2005, for trying to clean out some of that Bloody Brook area. And I drove by and somebody was leaf blowing their leaves back into the you know, Bloody Brook. And so you've, we've got to do public education that you can't rake your leaves into Bloody Brook and expect Bloody Brook to be free, free flowing. You have to be able to cart them off. You can cart them to the landfill. So and um, I'm, I hear that, but I'm also thinking it's really impractical for one person to dredge their section of Bloody Brook, you know, if, if, and they wouldn't pay for that. So I just wonder if there's any, just the way that the town paid for people to separate their stormwater from their sewage um, and make a separate. Um, take the sump pumps out. Yeah, correct. take the sump pumps out. That's what our first project was when we moved in 25 years ago. Um, I wonder if there's any way to, as, to get a group of homeowners to agree and to collectively fund you know, dredging that section on Jackson Road. Because I don't, I don't see any individual doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, you would have to, there's, there, presently right now, um, there's still a lot of DEP permits that would have to be taken care of, you know. Again, you know, with, with the Mosquito District, it, it, it lessens them, but it does not make them go away. It's not eliminating them, but. So it, it makes it a little bit easier, but again, does not make them disappear. I, mean, I don't know the geomorphology, hydrology, if that would improve things, but. And well, it can't it? hurt at this point. It, it I mean, because like, like I said, everything is filled in. If it fills in, I mean, you, you know, you think about it, you know, if you've got this much water right here and, and this big bowl, right. it's great. But as soon as you make it this big, well, it, it goes yeah. all over the place. To you've me, got the same amount like of water. We bowling. haven't been able to. is a missing piece. What, exactly. what we also need to do is maintain our ditches. A lot of the ditches like along 5 and 10, along our, um, you know, streets behind Kelleher Drive, as a matter of fact, they have not been maintained. 
And so the idea is, again, through the Mosquito District, trying to do that because we're using so much more salt on our roads rather than salt and sand. We're using a lot more salt. And so we're creating the runoff is much more saline, which Kills is, the plants. <laughs> well, it's, it's also makes it um, a breeding ground, like the eastern part of the state for triple E and other mosquitoes and stuff. So the idea is that we need to get to work on this. But we're just starting to form the mosquito district. So since we don't have a supervisor that um, can work with us at this point yet, we're, you know, we're hoping that this will happen by next year maybe, you know, next spring. But the idea is we're moving ahead along the lines of trying to clean out the Bloody Brook area and the, some of the ditches in town that are, are really. It's not like it's usable property for all those people. But again, I don't see an individual right. saying. I'm gonna but it, <laughs> it's public education as well. I mean, the leaves are going to be falling now pretty soon. So please don't rake leaves into the Bloody Brook. <laughs> just, we're we're just, trying to do whatever we can. Just so everyone knows, um, I am in the process now of working with our local conservation commission and uh, DEP to get a town-wide uh, annual permit for me to go along and clean the ditches on the sides of the road. Now, arbitrarily, if I wanted to go ahead and presently right now, if I wanted to go ahead and clean a certain section of, uh, say, lower road, I have to go get permits through the Conservation Commission, and then I have to go through all of the permitting process through DEP. Something like that it would take me probably all summer by the time I got through going through all of the things that they'd be requiring me to do. This is why we're attempting to go ahead and try and make it a town-wide yearly permit so that way I'm not required to go ahead and ask permission every time I want to go ahead and clean something out. Um, and that doesn't mean just going in there with a piece of machinery. If I go in there with a shovel and I start moving something out, I can be, the town can be liable for that um, because we're not supposed to do that. So that's why we're trying to work through multiple re ways to deal with this and keep water moving. Bruce? Uh oh, he's got a list. <laughs> uh, Bruce St. Peter's. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that has just happened. I started a shop in Deerfield in 1975 on a place up off North Main Street across, from the, uh, across the road from the brook. And at that point in time, it was an annual event. The uh, people in front of my shop ended up with three to four feet of water in their basement every year and if my memory served me right, it was almost annually that the Kelleher Drive flooded across, across the road. There was ponds all the way up to, beyond, be, uh, up to uh, Sokolowski's, uh, Sokolowski's landscape. I believe Captain Lathrop flooded several times too. And that was annually, every heavy storm. But I think what's happened is we ended up with a lot of drier years and now we're starting to get weather, wet weather coming back this year. So this is not something that's just happened this year. It's, it, it, it's no. I, you know, this is... it's, it, I started up in 1975, and it was an issue back then. And I, I don't think it's any worse now than it was then. I'm not saying it doesn't need to be taken care of, because it is a progressive thing. But, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, we have had many, many years of drier years where uh, some of the people that have not been around for that many years have never seen some of the uh, problems that have uh, uh, we've had over the years with flooding. And Mill Village is another area that used to flood almost annually uh, before, the, before you had the landslides and so forth. Uh, used to be floods out through there. So there's, there's, there's quite a few places uh, that, you know. I, don't, I, I mean, we're at the bottom of the bowl, so that we, we uh, certainly are going to have water problems. Exactly. Ex but exactly. we are and definitely having more intense events. And I know I've been traumatized since 2005 with yeah. events that um, we had four and a half million dollars worth of damage, I think, in 2005 flooding. I'm just saying that these issues it, were it in just, 1975 and they haven't been yeah. taken care of. It, it, so. it, there, is more, there is more damage being done and the yeah. dollar amounts so. are oh, no, definitely no costing more money. No, thank you. Yep. To, to kind of answer your part of your question, I think is what you're asking, Bruce, is, is now we're attempting to, to do something about it now. Um, what has happened in the past um, was before my time, probably before Carolyn's time, 
Yeah, um, and we're, we're attempting to go ahead and move forward at this point. You know, if we can go ahead and get some funding to help us allow, allow us to go ahead and move forward to make this happen, um, this is the reason why we're here to try and make this happen. Um, you know, I can't speak about the past. I'm, I'm not uh, pointing fingers. Oh, oh and by no means that I think you were, but I just wanted to make sure that people understood that, you know, yes, yes. Yes, we, we we understand where everybody's coming from, you know, and, and water's, water's, water's bad. I mean, I live over on West Street, and I have three sump pumps that run pretty much 24-7, 365. Um, the water table has definitely come up. Yeah. I, I was on the planning board in the early 80s, and I have to tell you, it was not 18 inches, which is pretty common across town now. Tim. Tim Hill, G330 Greenfield Road. Thankfully, my problems aren't as bad as my neighbor's problems on, on North Main Street and Keller Drive, but um, I just wanted to get some information. Uh, I have a, an acre of land at the bottom of my property that's right on Route 5 Greenfield Road, and there's a culvert in the, the corner near my drive, um, but the, the field is eroding into the culvert, so that's a silt problem, mm -hmm. um, and it looks to me like if there was a better design for the culvert that retained the soil in the property, that that would be a benefit. But I've tried to reach out to the state um, because I think it's in the, the right of way. That would be correct. That would be their um, culvert. But, but I get no response. So right. what's the procedure that could maybe lead to a better right, design you, for that culvert? And, and I'm sorry, I can't picture where your house is. Can it's you give me right near the, the Deerfield Greenhouse Builders. That corner um oh, okay like the so s curves down at the bottom of the hill two houses down from kip camosa's house okay all right okay all right so i just sorry i just had to try and figure out where you were uh, that is definitely the, the state layout um that is their culvert but again this is something that there's nothing saying that we collectively this could be part of the list that we put on to look to see if this is something you know because it looks like Chris some work's been done there to try to keep the soil in the but it's it's not a it's not a real job well right. what, what we have to do is um one of the things that i do is i call in when there's a problem so what you can do is you can call me mm -hmm. if you notice that it's starting to flood and then i'll call the um 24 hours desk yeah, and I, uh, make a complaint and what we can do is put it on our list because we want to we want to work with them all up and down five and ten because there's like there's three or four mm -hmm. different spots on mm -hmm. five and ten that the and I don't mean to suggest that my my problems are, are major problems I, I you know I would love to see my neighbors be helped far before I'm helped but it, it just seems that it's a symptom of a problem that's mm -hmm. townwide yeah agreed definitely agreed uh, and, and, and even and if anybody else has any of the smaller ones that they feel that they don't they're, they're nothing compared to the others. Um, that just gives us more information to be able to move forward to the state to allow us to have better, eh, never mind, I'm not gonna, I'll be using improper terminology. So anyway, so long story short is the more information we have, the better off we'll be. And that way we can list it. If it's not listed, we can't, we certainly can't put in for money. So you, you never know what, how, what's going to qualify or what programs are going to come down. I mean, we're constantly looking for programs and, and being proactive. Kevin has been really good about going to meetings and getting state people out here. And, and it's a matter of complaining because it's, it's not just us. It's all over the state. So what we do is we just keep bugging them and hopefully we'll end up having them work with us. Hi, I'm, for, I'm Wendy Foxman. I'm the town administrator. I've been quite involved with this grant and planning process. And timely, strange timing, but a wonderful timing. Uh, last year, we applied for a grant to with FEMA, uh, MEMA and FEMA, I guess, to update our natural hazardous, or multi-hazard mitigation plan. And we got news just today that we've got the grant, and that will be another opportunity to dig even much deeper, in fact, um, to look at what we had in the four 2014 plan, which I think took about two, two or three years to develop. Yes, and I don't know if that approved. was your first or you had plans before that. But, we had um, one before that, but okay. so uh, we have this, was, this was the new, the 2014 was under the new requirements, and that was much more... Okay. Uh, 
Well, um, had to have more d documentation. Despite what people say about higher levels of government, they are paying attention to climate change, particularly in Massachusetts, the administration as well as the legislature. And this program is born out of that interest. And they they put quite a bit of money behind both the planning and the action grants, and we're lucky to be beneficiaries of that. But at this time, we also have another opportunity to go even deeper, to take a look back at the plan that we have now that was from 2014 and update that and, and maybe look at some of the things, including um, potentials uh, uh, addressing state issues with the state um, on state roads and that kind of thing. It's a very deep, it's a much deeper dive into of the problems and the solutions than, than the MVP planning is. Our mitigation plan is good for five years, so this is it's really important. handy because this is one of the things that when you go to apply for a grant, you have to have on the checkoff box. So having this, um, getting the grant money to get this renewed is a huge relief because that means we can just renew it and um, be eligible for more grants down the line. So, um, and we're hoping, like Wendy said, the discussion, we could widen the discussion to include the state culverts along 5 and 10, um, because that clearly has huge impact in our town. Here's it. Here is it if you want to glance at it. I'll put it on the table. Um, the other thing they, they speak to, um, which is new, is, is this project that we we're in the midst of what the listening, here, listening session is about. They're actually, for the first time, addressing it using terms like climate change. So they're recognizing that. But um, thanks to you, Carolyn, this town is and, you know, we're a very wet town, you know, just listening to that story, it's heartbreaking, and I know there are many more, um, but this, and Carolyn's foresight around this and uh, river issues and all of that has made a big difference and will continue to make a difference, so. Well, we I'm need, just paranoid. We need more people from the community to work with. Yes. As, we, and as we, we already do have a lot, but we need even more. Um, I must say, though, one of the other recommendations was to have a, an emergency action plan with Great River Hydro. They have the dams along the Connecticut and the Deerfield River. And the license was transferred from TransCanada to Great River Hydro back in May of 2017. And I have to say, all my complaining and all my witching has finally paid off. They are rolling out the emergency action plan October 11th here at the town hall. If anyone wants to come, it's 9.30 to 12.30. And um, hopefully the program will work and um, it, will be, um, it will be able to work with them on um, having some kind of response if there was an emergency and have better communication. Because the water flow comes down, it's very important that they draw down and they don't have the infrastructure that TransCanada did and so it, may, it makes us a little bit more nervous um, when these storms come. So we're hoping that this will enhance c communication with the company and um, give us reassurance that we have a response if an emergency happens. I realize we only have a couple October of minutes 11th. left here. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that anybody who hasn't had a chance to talk does get a chance to say what they want to say. Rocky. Thank Hi, you. my name's Rocky Foley. I live at 16 South Main Street. Um, I uh, just want to remind people, too, that it's not the only, uh, I feel bad for the people on Bloody Book and North Main Street, but if I remember right, uh, in the last couple of years or so, over on Graves Street and between Graves and Mountain Road, uh, they've been complaining about flooding up yep. in that area, too. Yes. I live on 16 South Main Street, and I have a book that runs behind my house. I think it's called Blacksmith's Book. Okay. And uh, when we get the heavy rains and everything like that, I'm getting a lot of erosion okay, off my bank. In fact, this, within the past year, I've had four, six-inch trees come down off of my property and go across the book uh, from, a, you know, from when the water's starting to uh, flow faster. Um, and then about 20 years ago, I had my uh, furnace replaced. And when they came in to replace it, they actually suspended it from my joist. Because wow. the other one that used to be on the ground, from the ground up and everything, it was rusted about a foot up. So whenever the high water table would come up, 
So wow. when I had my furnace put in 20 years ago, they had to literally suspend it from my joist. Uh, wow. so. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention, uh, remind you about the uh, uh, the flooding over on um, Mount yes. Road and Grave Street. Yep. Thank you, Rocky. Is there anyone else that would like to say something? We need to go to our meeting. Yeah. Hi. Karen Dodge, 142 North Main. And uh, since a neighbor of mine has already spoken, um, I'll just say that I've been here about 15 or 16 years now, and the first time my basement and garage flooded um, up to about the second or third step in the, in the basement was about a week after I moved into the house. <laughs> oh, no. And fortunately, um, well, every time we have a big rain event, people might walk by and see me pulling out lawnmowers and bikes and that kind of stuff from my garage, and fortunately, it gets up very close more often than it actually goes in, but I have been pulling stuff out of the garage more frequently than I used to, definitely. Um, and uh, two things. I was wondering um, what type of culvert assessments have been done and if, if there's been any playing around with the data to find out, you know, if you can't get the private culverts updated, if there's if expanding the ones downstream do enough? Um, it's really passing water, but well, Kevin, you're probably better at explanation on this. Opening up further downstream would be extremely helpful, obviously, because that way the water would have some place to go. Mm -hmm. But if you've got some place that's bottlenecked up, it's, if, it's, if it's restricted there so much that it can't get through, it's, it's going to flood. Um, so unfortunately, there are going to be some areas that, again, we're looking into to see if we can go ahead and, and get some money towards some of these private ones, which would definitely help out on North Main Street. Um, but that is, I don't, even, I don't even know what the percentage would be of being able to get that. I mean, it was, it was a question that I had today and said, you know, can we go ahead and put this out to see if, if it's possible? Because, mm -hmm. again, I you know. I can think of at least three that are an issue right there on North Main Street that help bottleneck everything up um, in opening them up. You know, if you open them up to a three-sided culvert, um, you know, it allows the aquatic life to be able to do what they're supposed to do. And a lot of people go, well, you know, it's Bloody Brook, there's nothing in there. Well, actually there is. Mm -hmm. um, and with that aquatic life, you know, that does open up different avenues of being able to get funding for things. Um, but if you don't have it, then there's other, there's, you are restricted because many of the ones that he talked about earlier of the different funding sources that there are, there are some pretty stringent um, restrictions as to the ins and the outs of what you can and can't do or um, requirements of it. So like very simply, uh, more, uh, Mill Village Road on the north end, uh, the reason why that has been down to a one lane road is because I refuse to spend 160 to $200,000 of the town's money. I flat up refuse. The road is open. You can get vehicles through there, not a problem. What we ended up doing is we went to DEP and I says, okay, I'm not going into the stream. Am I allowed to go ahead and take this three foot pipe, lay it on top of this, the embankment? I'm not in the stream. That way I'm not affecting anything here. And this is my flood protection pipe. Am I allowed to do this? And they said, yes. I said, really? Um, they allowed us to do it. And that has basically stopped that swamp from, from flooding. But again, the problem you have on the backside of Wapping is you can't get it from Wapping Road 5 and 10 to that large pipe that we have right now that will eventually have the proper, if we get the funding, we'll get the proper uh, culvert put in there. But again, you know, I've, I personally have, because I'm a taxpayer too, I have a serious problem about spending money of the towns that I see that we can have basically spend somebody else's money. And, and Kevin did a look into some other programs um, for that area, but it, because it's been so compromised, it was not eligible for the endangered species and all these different kind of um, culverts that would protect, um, you know, that you could upgrade with and protect um, uh, that area. So, you know, this, this seems to be, we did get the grant to do um, the engineering and design work that will in and look at 
the silting in the area and will take into consideration the silting. So um, we're pretty excited and we're hoping that we will get the implementation grant for it. And again, so it's, you know, we're, it's the state is paying, through, paying for it through this program. Okay. And the other question I had was about the floodplain mapping. And is that something that will only uh, impact new development? Um, Chris when I first addressed it. About when I first this. moved in or to my house, I saw the floodplain maps, and on North Main it went like like you know up and down around each house, <laughs> you know, and um, and that was how I got around having to pay for flood insurance. I said, hey, look, my my house is not in a floodplain. It goes around my house. Um, uh, I wouldn't be too thrilled about having to pay for flood insurance uh, because. I pull stuff out of my garage and there's nothing that's, you know, I mean, there's nothing that's, that's going to be ruined to begin with, really. The house has been there for 200 years. Um, so I'm just wondering what will change and why the town is doing that. I'm not understanding um, what the requirements are 100% of the flood. You're not required to buy flood insurance mm, I, um, unless you have a mortgage that, um, that you're just taking out. Um, what do you mean? Well, well isn't everyone bank, pretty much taken out of, well, well, no, yes, I mean, you, you mean for new transfers, yeah. but that will impact people's properties, of course, when they go to resell as well. Yeah. I, I was but, just wondering if there's a benefit to redrawing the map, aside from being accurate. <laughs> yeah, I think that the main benefit is to um, help the town understand where the floodplain actually is at this point because mm -hmm. with climate change the, the, there's an increase in the amount of intensity of, of storms and the amount of water that is coming into these storms. Um, so by redrawing the boundaries it helps to inform the town's floodplain zoning mm -hmm. for example so that we're not building additional new homes in floodplains where they're just going to be subjected to misery and, and problems. Um, so I think that that's one of the main goals is to is to inform the floodplain zoning bylaw so that that does have a direct um, implication for new development, not so much for existing homes, but mm -hmm. for new development. Um, any new development that is is done um, in the floodplain would have to meet certain standards um, for elevation of the floors and things like that, um, which okay. is sort of common sense stuff that needs to be done. All right. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you everyone for coming. Just please, please make sure you sign in. We need every single signature, so thank and, you. And if I could remind folks, um, if you have any additional suggestions or comments that you didn't have time to make tonight, there's those index cards that I think everybody got. Um, please feel free to write those th thoughts and suggestions down. Leave them on the table over here if you would. Um, and we'd be happy to take those kinds of comments as well. Thank you very much again. I really, really appreciate it. this will have a huge impact on our ability to get money. So thank you for coming.